question that uh, we'll start with, first question, um, and this has to do with how we think about marriage. If we agree that marriage is, as a public marriage is defined, the public interest marriage is defined by the attachment of mothers and fathers to their children, what do we do with the objection? Uh, what do we make of couples that are infertile, that, that might not be able to have children? So I'll throw that out there. In the okay, middle. okay. Uh, first of all, any married couple that stays married for any length of time will eventually fit into this category. Steve, me, you know, eventually, we, eventually your reproductive thing shuts down, you know, that's the way it is. And you don't end the marriage over that, right? Because you've already established a family and you're part of the family and you're, you know, your, your union continues to be meaningful even though you're not continuing to produce children. So that, that piece of it, you know, let's set that aside, okay? Then the other, the other part are people who get married intending to have children and then are, are find that they're unable to have children. Um, what people will sometimes in a facetious way say is, you know, well, if that's really what it's all about, why don't we test people for fertility and so on and so forth. Well, the reason we don't test people for fertility is it's none of the government's business, okay? And, and so to let people in to the institution of marriage who may be involuntarily infertile does not in any way damage the social purpose and meaning of the institution because they're not taking away from it. They, they would like to have children, they'd like to be part of it, um, and in fact, one time, uh, and, and the intrusion of figuring out who, can, who actually is fertile and not, um, prior to doing the, the meaningful experiment of having long-term sex with one, with one partner, the intrusion that would be involved would be really objectionable, I think, to, to everyone. And so one time on my blog, I, there's a, you guys should go look at the Ruth blog sometimes. There's always a lot of dynamic going on in there. Um, I posted a picture. This came into my mind when the Pope was visiting the UK. I posted a picture and it, and it said, Exhibit A as to why we don't make, mandate fertility as a condition of marriage, and it was a picture of Henry VIII. Okay, so think about it. Um, Henry VIII, his position was that if the woman doesn't produce the baby I want, I get to get rid of her. You know, so obviously that's not, um, what do I want to say, a, a socially constructive approach to take to the institution of marriage. He basically got to ditch people um, if, if they didn't produce the way he wanted. So, um, so that's the involuntarily um, infertile. That's how I would address that, that, that excluding them would be so intrusive and have so many negative effects that it doesn't make sense and it doesn't really serve the purpose. The, I think we should say something, though, about um, those who are voluntarily infertile, that is to say, people who get married with no intention of having any children. Um, <clears throat> now, many of you here are Catholic, I gather, right? Is that right? We have a few Catholics here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so first of all, you all probably know that under canon law, that's not a valid marriage. Okay, so the Catholic position is perfectly consistent on this point. That's considered, if you enter into a union with the intention of never having children, you're not validly married. Um, and, and so the Catholic Church is completely coherent in that way, you know, of, of, of addressing that. But the, pretend you're not Catholic, pretend you know people who aren't Catholic, um, um, <laughs> just for sake of argument. Um, um, so we have a social institution whose social purpose is, to, um, is, is something that has to do with children. Now we have people participating in the, that social institution, reaping the benefits of it without contributing to its social purpose. What do we call that? Bear in mind my doctorates in economics. What do we call that in economics when people do that? We call those free riders, right? Okay, so people who get married take advantage of all of the advantages of, of, the, um, of the social institution of marriage without contributing it to, to it. Those are free riders. What do we know about free riders in economics? You can't handle too many of them, right? If you have too many free riders in your system, the train will break down, you know, basically. Um, and so people will start to say, well, what's the point of this institution? And uh, the weight that they're, the drag that they're putting on the institution will start, to, will start to become a problem and you'll have to do things that are more intrusive than just have the social institution. So, you know, people don't know what the point of marriage is. People don't know why it's important. Um, people don't know why children are important. We're just as valid as you are. You know, are we there yet? I mean, that's really where we are in this society is with a lot of people not seeing the point um, of, uh, of marriage, of not seeing why you have the social institution of marriage. In their minds, they've already redefined it. And so, um, and they can't figure out why the law just doesn't follow along with their redefinition that marriage is just about us. Um, 
So in a sense, we're already in a way reaping the result of having a lot of people who are taking advantage of the benefits of marriage without participating in it. And there isn't, within economics, there usually isn't a good solution to that problem, right? I mean, if you have, just have free riding, then it's a problem. But they are free riders, and you know, we're, we're, it's like we're afraid to say that, you know, that you guys are kind of taking advantage of things here and not really contributing. So quit bitching at us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Chase. Um, my question, I guess, goes back to the uh, first talk we had, which I guess we're talking about like uh, becoming really, really good friends in marriage. And my, my question, I guess, is perhaps when we're emphasizing abstinence and all these things, are we putting too much pressure on the marriage itself? I mean, I know you mentioned uh, Aristotle, in fact, um, in your first talk, and you know, about this depth of friendship. But I mean, Aristotle also mentions you need to be friends with someone for 10 years, 15 years, before you possibly really know the person. And uh, there are quotes that come to mind from Chester and the like. You know, you don't marry the wrong person, or I guess that's Tolkien, but um, I mean, you're, go you're gonna marry the wrong person, almost definitely. And yes, you know, we have ability to put someone who's going to fit you best. And I actually, I've talked with Jennifer about this at UNC. But, at what level are we putting so much pressure on marriage because we're telling people to be absent for so long that we're thinking that there's, this is going to be an end in and of itself, that this is going to be happiness on earth? And at what level is that not really realistic? You know, at what level is the purpose of marriage and, you know, the sanctification of marriage actually through suffering indeed? And perhaps, you know, the end definitely not being marriage in and So I'm just, perhaps is this a problem within our movement? I think your point is well taken. Uh, this is why I like the notion that we should see marriage as a formative institution, not one that we enter into when we're finished being formed. And so what you're really talking about is realistic expectations. And I still think Aristotle's no notions of a virtue friendship, of a character friendship come into play, because what that really puts as the foundation is that we see that we have enough of the common vision. We have enough of the shared partnership. But you, I, I love what you say there, because it captures the idea that in courtship and in early marriage, we will seek for a certain level of congruence, of similarity and partnership, but we'll hold open to the notion that that is a partnership and a connection and a unity. Compatibility is the term we throw around in, in, in modern culture with this, that there's going to be a certain level of that at the beginning, but that it can deepen and it can grow. And that makes sense because as partners through their marriage will create space for each other so that the other, as, as they adapt and as they change and as they grow and fill where they need to. Part of this is also fueled, I think, by our soulmate culture. And soulmate culture would tell us that when we do find the right person, that it will be complete from the very beginning. The notion of a created companionship uh, so we can indeed become one and onlys, even without the notion of a one soulmate. Because that one and only is going to come about as we adapt, as we grow, as we change. So we see it as a process. But if we have that commitment to the similar vision and the partnership to carry us forward, then we know that we can have a foundation to embark in that journey together. But I like what you're saying. We do have to have realistic expectations when it comes to emotional intimacy, when it comes to the connections of the relationship. The key is that there's the commitment and the common vision, and that will allow the process then to proceed across the course of the marriage. Can I just add to that? Sorry, I'd like to add to that. Um, I think the issue that you bring up is really, 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 really important. And one of the things that um, I've I think that one of the best articulations of it is that, that I've found is that I think sometimes people are, when they're looking at marriage, they're looking for the one thing that's going to make them happy. And this is going to be the completion. And they put so many unrealistic expectations in the other person that frankly the only person that can satisfy that is the divine person or persons. And I think that people mistake um, desires that I mean, fundamentally, only God, at least from a Christian perspective, that only God can satisfy, and they put those on another human being. And there is no way that anyone can survive those types of expectations. Then you're set up for failure. So I think part of it is 
backing up and saying, wait a minute, what can I realistically expect from another human being? Yes, companionship, yes, friendship, um, but it's, it's not gonna be perfect in every sense, and you're not gonna have perfect understanding and perfect fulfillment and perfect anything. Those are the things that you need to cultivate in your spiritual life. And in point of fact, there are going to be days when you're going to uh, retract some of your vows, you know, or feel like retracting. You know, if you were asked to do the vow again on that day, you wouldn't, you know, say everything that you promised. Me. I mean, you know, that just to be realistic, to be really realistic, there are days when you're not going to, you know, that that person's going to look awful to you, and you're going to look awful to them. And so that's part of the realism of the thing, too. But but it's by persistence. You know, uh, through the common through the common vision and the common goal, you you get over that and you can relax in their imperfection and relax in your own imperfection. And at the end of the day, you're you're in a, a, a situation of even deeper intimacy. One quick final comment on that: If you want a great book to read, it's by Blaine Fowers at the University of Miami. That has built a virtues model of marriage. He builds on the Aristotelian notion. Tying into your question, the title of his book is Beyond the Myth of Marital Happiness. And it is this idea of getting beyond the idea that it is just purely personal satisfaction and happiness that will sustain a marriage. So a great read, and it goes exactly in that type of direction. Uh, just a quick thought. It seems to me, uh, in hearing the conference, in some ways, you're, you're too pessimistic. Uh, I think there is a way to confront the hookup culture because I think the overwhelming majority, at least upper class women, religious or not, don't like it. And I can provide lots of evidence uh, showing that, I think. And this, I, then I think, uh, since, ever, since almost everybody wants to get married at some point, if you want to avoid choosing the wrong person, uh, you might s simply ask people who aren't of your persuasion uh, do you think hookups are a good way to find the right person? Do you think joining at the hips is a good way to find the right person? Wouldn't it make more sense to date s several, more than several people of the opposite sex to see what they're like? You're much more likely to find the uh, right person that way, I think. Okay, a very practical question. Uh, in a friendship between a man and a woman, or perhaps a dating relationship, how does one avoid the danger of too much emotional intimacy, which may create bonds appropriate only in a marriage? I think they want you to answer that. <laughs> to me, that's where that notion of stages of dating come in. Um, so that we, there's a clear sense of communication about the problem is when the emotional intimacy outpaces the level of commitment. That's where the biggest difficulties come into play. And that's where the hanging out culture, not just the hooking up culture, but the hanging out culture is creating difficulties. Because now young people spend time, uh, and I, and even in the teenage years, uh, hanging out, pairing off, and going to deep, deep levels of emotional disclosure and sharing of themselves. But in that time, they're not in a position to then, for that to fit into a relationship pattern of appropriate commitment symbols, uh, oftentimes leading particularly in, in less mature uh, perspectives and, and, and brain development of the teenage years. Uh, the frontal cortex, those brakes aren't there, and, uh, and we see much of the physical uh, symbols start to outpace as well. So I think the key is, is that when we see it progressing through those stages and we realize uh, and we make intentional effort that the emotional disclosure matches the stage. If we're in paired dating, dating multiple people to, to get to know, it's really a selection phase of dating. Emotional intimacy should probably be uh, only go to a certain level of depth, some talking intimacy, some levels of sharing to get to know somebody, to understand perspectives and views. But we probably would stay away from more of the revealing, disclosing type intimacy that doesn't fit in those types of contexts. As we find a relationship that has potential, uh, we move into an exclusive dating situation where we'll close off the other dating opportunities to explore the full potential of that relationship. Now, deeper levels of emotional intimacy will be more congruent. Deeper disclosure, there's more of a sense of understanding of what that relationship's about. I tell my students all the time, you better never just find yourself in an exclusive relationship. Too often it's happening in ways that people find themselves there. A friend comes to them and says, I was talking to John, who said something to Susie, who talked, and he said, he called you his girlfriend. I think you guys are a couple. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. And it kind of comes back around, or somebody changes their status on Facebook, or by definition, if you don't have the ability to talk about your relationship with somebody, you probably shouldn't be in an exclusive relationship with them. Uh, but so as that progresses, then of course as that would then move to the potential is confirmed and we've moved to a stage of engaged dating, now we start to move towards the formation of, of spousal preeminence. We're now looking at forsaking all others and making that commitment as we move towards uh, the covenant of marriage. So all of those stages help give us a sense of what would be appropriate levels of emotional disclosure so that they stay congruent. It's all about symbolism. It's all about the meaning and the shared meaning the couple's building. The problem is when the disclosure goes so deep, yet the commitment is this high. The other problem that we see is uh, if we go to Scott Stanley's work at the University of Denver on sacrifice, he finds that men and women uh, sacrifice in relationships at different times. Women begin to sacrifice for a relationship typically when they become attached, when they become bonded, they'll start to sacrifice. Men, he has found in his studies, they wait until they commit, until they see a long-term uh, future to that relationship. So this creates a common phenomenon, these emotional intimacies go deep, but the commitment's not there, we get the, what I sometimes call half a boyfriend's better than no boyfriend phenomenon where we start to have very incongruent commitment patterns, frequently with the young woman being exclusive, waiting for a young man to make up his mind. That's not a really good foundation for building that type of intimacy and that type of disclosure. There's anxiety in that. There's ambiguity in that. Those will all create difficulties in the depth of the emotional intimacy. So I think it has to be tied to those stages of progressive commitment that will help us know what's appropriate disclosure and intimacy and what's uh, not going to be so helpful. Jason, this is kind of a question for Jason and the panel on the hook of the whole issue. You mentioned Facebook status. I get this call this morning. Okay, just to illustrate, I have a 16 year old daughter. She's on the way home. She's going on her first date, double date, you know. And uh, so she has a crush on this little guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so today I find out, I said, gosh, Rebecca went on one date with this kid. And he wrote on his Facebook page that he's in a relationship. And it was like, so, and I'm like, uh, tell him to erase it, delete it, and I'll delete his Facebook page for him. Okay? I mean, so my question is this issue of status and of intimacy. I mean, you have relationships, and you know, it's based on uh, the, the texting culture. The, the, I'm in a relationship because I put it for everyone to see. Uh, what is that doing to our intimacy? just to relationships. I'd be interested to hear from the panel's responses on that. The texting generation, the Facebook phenomenon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that. I don't have any opinion, but, but another way it comes up, I think. <laughs> but, it, but I am going to talk about the question, because as I understood the question, it was about opposite sex friendships becoming something else. And, and I love the fact that more than my generation, there are opposite sex friendships, but remember this, when you get married, your wife or husband's not going to understand that you talk to so-and-so every week. And it's not, it's just platonic, it's always been, it's just, it's going to be a problem. And it, it, so there's a certain sadness coming up, I think. If, if your best friends are the opposite sex, you may find it's very, very hard to stay in touch with them in the way you do now. I think too, the, some of those transitions, um, I wouldn't say that you use that as a reason not to engage in those relationships. I mean, just prepare yourself. I mean, these relationships are not permanent. They're going to change. And um, it, it actually can become, you can end up becoming very close to, you know, that person and that person's spouse as well, particularly if you respect um, the preeminence of the spouse in, in that relationship. And you realize that that's going to change, that's going to put you really on the back burner in many ways. But you can still, I think if you're realistic about it, you can still enjoy good friendships uh, on that. But to the larger question, I think we're, uh, I think social media in general is really challenging the whole question of friendship and intimacy, because you talk about intimacy and relationships, but I mean, my gosh, there's, there's really, a, there's a whole lack of intimacy in the culture. I mean, we, we say and do everything on Facebook or whatever your outlet is. Um, uh, 
I, I think that I, I'm becoming more, my husband works for a technology company, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the technology all the time, all day long. And I really am thinking that we, we kind of have to be intentional, I mean, intentional decisions about our lives, kind of like, you know, eating local, being green, all these different things. Honest to God, like, I think we have to be intentional about how we use the means of communication um, and, and, and our friendships and relationships, because it's, it's very hard to say, don't be intimate, don't be overly intimate in your friendships when you're, you, you put all the details out on Facebook. I mean, I think there has to be a conscientious decision that each person engages in and says, you know, wait a minute, where do I want to go? What do I want to be? Who do I want to be? And, and then implement the tools. But you're going to have problems with intimacy if you don't even understand what it is or if you forego all intimacy and blast it to the world. And I think that's totally changing the, the I mean, I have almost a thousand friends on Facebook and I don't even know, I mean, I, I, they're all, I assume they're all very nice people, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, I would make one heck of a Mexican cocktail party. <laughs> So you, the, the term itself is being used so broadly, um, and you know, fine, it works for Facebook, but I, I, I think we have to challenge ourselves and be very careful in how we use it. You said something interesting related to um, the Facebook. I heard uh, some radio, so I know the research very well. It's actually really about adults and how infidelity among adults is actually um, expedited by these um, internet new forms of communication. So. Um, it used to be that you know it'd be really strange for you to call a colleague you know, after dinner um, because you're stuck and pick up the phone. But now it's a lot easier just to friend someone on Facebook. And so the relationship, um, the sort of extramarital uh, relationship, come a lot quicker because of email, texting, um, and Facebook. So I'm not sure how that would apply to sort of the younger generation. But at the same time, I think there is something about ease of communication that. Um, you know, there's no limit to, you know, there are no rules, you know, um, past midnight might be weird for you to be hanging out in, you know, person of opposite of gender's own room, but you can email and, you know, late at night, you know, guards down, so you're sharing a lot more than you would share in other contexts. So, uh, that's sort of one implication, I think, of the, the new, um, those of communication that we have really facilitated by, um, and the internet, um, and other things. So, but just practically thinking about the question, um, just out of guidelines, I mean, um, you know, when I was in college, you know, uh, there was just something practical, like you wouldn't hang out with a guy alone past, you know, 10 o'clock, you know. Um, late at night, you start talking, and you get more into a conversation than you really want to. Um, just, you know, sort of limit your emailing each other, you know, what point do you want it? You're just trying to, you know, how much you want to disclose about your past and, you know, what you're going through. So um, just setting up sort of very practical guidelines, you know, Limit sort of the um, speed of the emotional attachment of the actual commitment that you have in a relationship could be helpful. In that. Well, I would just like to invite everyone to become my Facebook friend yeah. and friend of Ruth Institute, and I promise I won't blast you with personal information. <laughs> uh, I am actually almost running out of space up here for questions, so I'm going to have a number of good questions. Uh, let me try a, a plea, I guess, that this, this next question I think is, is a really good one, or it's one that that a lot of students will run into. And, and um, given that as talented and smart as students are, they may not be able to give as long an answer as our experts. Is there a succinct way to respond to this question? Like how I did that? Okay. The question is this. Uh, what do we do with the objection um, or the challenge that isn't same-sex marriage the equivalent to uh, the bans on biracial marriage? And let me add a uh, play devil's advocate here. Um, it, not long ago, Mrs. Loving of Loving versus Virginia came out and actually made this very analogy uh, that, that uh, opposing same-sex marriage is the equivalent of what was done to her and her husband uh, opposing a uh, biracial marriage. So what's a good way to respond to that uh, objection? Point number one, most African Americans, the vast majority of African Americans, not only don't agree with that argument, they deeply, deeply resent that argument. Uh, because they don't think that that's a civil rights issue in the same way that, that uh, their civil rights struggle was a civil rights struggle. I can't tell you how many times I have encountered that from people, that they don't consider that equivalent. Um, and the, the simple answer is that race is irrelevant to marriage, but gender is absolutely relevant to marriage. I mean, what we're talking about is taking away the core meaning of why you have marriage as an institution in the first place, um, that removing the requirement of dual gender, basically you're transforming marriage into a friendship 
and nothing but a friendship. And so I think the right answer is, um, why do we want the government to have a registry of friendships? Because that's what, if we use Judge Walker's definition of marriage, that's what will be left of marriage. Uh, we've got a couple questions on what is likely to be an uh, interesting topic, and it did come up in Christine Kim's talk a little bit. Um, what is the role in, to my mind, this will be something that even in this room, folks may have some disagreement about, what is the role of contraception in some of these debates that we had, both historically, how we've gotten here, um, and in looking forward to kind of uh, reestablish or promote a culture of chastity and love? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, this is uh, related anyway. I, I think there's two things that people don't understand about birth control. Uh, first of all, that it completely messes up your smell, your pheromones. Uh, you're attracted to, uh, you're naturally attracted to people with a different immune system because this makes for a stronger bond in your children, stronger, better health in your children. If you're on birth control, it's just the reverse. How do they know this? They do these smell tests. They actually take, take t-shirts off men and ask women to smell. And, uh, and uh, there's complete disagreement about which ones smell the best, but it does turn out that those on birth control pills, it all gets messed up, so you might be attracted to the wrong guy. And second, it lowers your libido. So in other words, you're probably, people are probably on birth control to please some man, and uh, that will be less interested in sex uh, if they uh, Take it. Are we each jumping in on this? If you want to. Do you want to say something? Do you have something to say? Sure. I've always got something to say. Um, well, two things. I think I went to Dr. Rhodes' point. There was a great article in Elle magazine a few years ago, uh, Why You Shouldn't Be on Hormonal Contraception or Antidepressants for Very Long. And I can email you a PDF. They no longer have the article on their site. But it's based on a lot of this research. And it was really fascinating because women on hormonal birth control, for example, in the, the stinky t-shirt contest, um, they, women on hormonal birth control did not choose the alpha males. And when they were off of hormonal birth control, they chose the alpha males. So from a strictly biological point, that raises some questions. Um, then you have the whole issue of libido. And, uh, but I think, to my mind, I think it's, it's uh, there's a much bigger philosophical question, I guess. I was almost surprised Dr. Hilton didn't mention, you know, 1968 is Griswold versus Connecticut. 65, 65 sorry, 65 is Griswold versus Connecticut. Um, then, I, I mean, I, as a Catholic theologian, I frankly think that the reason that we have even have a debate about gay marriage is because, or same-sex marriage is because we, there are two things: no-fault divorce and why the and contraception. And I think if you have um, Jack and Jill who are in a marriage that you know they can walk away from at will. Um, maybe they don't have the intention of doing so, but they can. And they're also not open to children, not having children. On a practical level, it's very hard to distinguish that from Adam and Steve. And yes, Adam, uh, Jack and Jill can change their circumstances and, and change their actions and their intents. But again, on a practical level, marriage becomes much more a lifestyle choice, um, a question of personal fulfillment, rather than this unique entity in and of itself that's ordered towards the family. So I think the contraception issue is huge, and I think it, it needs a lot more attention, because it's, it, it's all part of this debate. And frankly, it was contraception that paved the way for abortion. And you know, Alan Guttmacher Institute, which is a research arm of Planned Parenthood, has a great, you know, a great number of, they, it's, it's, you know, you usually hear the thing, well, if there were more contraceptives, there'd be less abortion, right? <laughs> well, it's either, it's either 56 or, or I mean, 54 or 46 percent, but 50, I think it's 50, 46 percent of the women who come in for abortions were using contraceptives when they got pregnant. I mean, that's huge. So, effectively, they don't even work to prevent pregnancy. Um, I, so, I think that the whole contraception issue needs to be looked at much more because I think on a practical level, there are a lot of ramifications, and even if you don't want to get into the religious issues on it, um, I think you, you end up between no-fault divorce and contraception, you end up in a situation where I think, practically speaking, it is very, very difficult uh, to defend heterosexual marriage and to preclude same-sex marriage. There's no question that biologically, 
um, you know, Kinsey's 1948 bombshell uh, sexual behavior in a human male, followed three years later by sexual behavior in a human female, which then, uh, you know, a couple of years later, um, 53, you have Huffman publishing Playboy, uh, getting that kicked off and saying, Kinsey was my prophet and I'm the pamphleteer. And uh, so there's this calculated, um, really, uh, plan to move into a, a world where we, we use sexuality recreationally. And then we have the technology, contraception, uh, which allows us to make that a reality, physically a reality, to literally disconnect human sexuality from procreation. And when it's uh, moths, we say, ooh, that's bad. Let's put them on the endangered species list. When it's humans, we say, oh, I wonder why Germany is not reproducing. Um, and then, of course, and you add abortion to that, and it's a culture of the denigration of life. And again, the disconnection of sexuality from procreation. And you know, it's in the end all about biology. The rest is just conversation. We're not doing very well at reproducing ourselves right now. Our DNA lines are not. Now, you could argue, what about? Um, what about parts of Africa? What about, you know, there's areas where you still see fertility rates high, where death rates are pretty high in those areas too. I've lived in Africa, I've been a missionary for a couple of years in Africa, and, and so uh, be careful about trumpeting uh, parts of Africa as a demographic success. Um, the other point that I think is important, particularly with regards to women, uh, again, from a philosophical and psychological perspective, Contraception is essentially saying there's one part of you that I don't want, or there's one part of myself that I don't want. And that's that vulnerability. And particularly in sexual intimacy, there is a unique vulnerability that women have. I mean, it's the woman that ends up pregnant, not the man. And for good or for ill, you know? So, and yet I think that this culture of contraception is denying that vulnerability in women. And that vulnerability is, I think, constructive part of who we are. I don't think it's necessarily a weakness. I think it's a vulner yes, a vulnerability, but it's part of who we are. And as a culture, we are denying that on a widespread level. So I think what, what this is doing philosophically and psychologically is, is huge. Uh, because you're saying, I want you, or I want to give myself to you, but only part, not entirely. I'm holding something back. Um, and and, you know, and like when a couple is contracepting, they are each, in fact, holding something back. Neither one of them can be wholly vulnerable in that situation. And I think that, that that lessens intimacy. If you're holding back, how can you be truly intimate? I just want to speak uh, very quickly from a public policy perspective. I think a lot of the discussion um, at the um, middle school and high school level is about you know, sort of what kind of sex education should you have in the classroom, absence education, sex ed, and it's been going on for a long time. And also, you know, sort of um, in some of the uh, lower income communities where out of wedlock birth is a problem and the solution, you know, sort of from the government's perspective is to just, you know, teach them about contraception. Um, if they have knowledge, better knowledge, better access, problems are solved. And the problem is not knowledge and access. Um, this is very well documented in research and I think it really is um, a misdiagnosis of the problem and a wrong solution. And that's why the problems are not being solved when you just say, you know, more contraception and better education. Um, you're not addressing, I think, for, um, for teens, um, the role of parents and how they should be the primary teachers and not the classroom. And some, you know, you're standing up there and telling them, you know, how to do this and how to do that. Um, and I think for, you know, um, for adults too, you know, sort of just have more clinic, more access in these communities and that will solve the problem. That's not addressing the issue. So I think that sort of culture, I think from a public policy perspective is really, I think, um, if not something problem, is adding to the problem by not getting other causes. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna take a turn here too because I agree that this is a huge issue and that our misunderstanding about contraception is at the heart of a lot of things. One um, little irony that was implied, I think, in your, in your paper, because um, you cited Akerlof and his work. I mean, the, the, the real question is, why is it that in the age of unlimited, essentially unlimited access to contraception and abortion, you have a skyrocket in the out of wedlock childbearing rate. Why do, Why is that? Okay, and so I mean, because that shouldn't be. You know, if the, if the if the solution were contraception, we should have we should have solved that a long time ago. You know, so 
What Ackerlock really shows is that introducing um, abortion and contraception changes the whole dynamic of how men and women interact with one another. It puts pressure on everybody to perform sexually because uh, you're competing in a market against people who are willing to abort their babies in the event of unplanned pregnancy. Um, and so their analysis is, is I think, very, very important because it shows that you can't just say, well, uh, if you don't like contraception, don't use it. Um, the existence of contraception and, and abortion changes the competitive dynamics for everybody, um, and you can't really opt out of it, you know? And so that, that's why that whole argument is kind of a dodge. So I think that, that's a very important point. Um, and, and, you know, people forget that it, it wasn't always the case that the government took an interest in people's reproductive behavior. I think we should just take a step back and ask, look at that question too. How did it ever get to be any of the government's business whatsoever whether I have two children or ten or none, why is that their business? You know, when did that start to be their business? You know, um, at the very time that the Supreme Court is saying uh, there's a right to privacy to determine whether you reproduce or not, it's right around that same era that the federal government starts p pumping massive amounts of money into teaching people how to use contraception and in telling people, telling states that if they accept federal money for Medicaid, they must um, make contraception available to minors without their parents' consent. That's not a morally neutral position. When Medicaid uh, says that you have to, uh, if you take our money, you have to uh, make contraception available without parental consent to minors, that's not a morally neutral position. When Medicaid reimburses uh, family planning services, so-called family planning services, at 90%, and they reimburse other, other services at 50%, that's not a morally neutral statement. That's the government saying that, um, that contraception is our business, our federal business. So in a way, the federal government has federalized um, sex policy a, a little, you know, Utah can't say we're gonna have a different policy, or you know, each state is required to participate um, in, the, in these programs, so I think it's very serious. The, the last point I wanna make, you brought it to mind to talk about Africa. Um, of course, International Planned Parenthood Federation, with the help of uh, USAID, has pumped billions of dollars into promoting contraception abroad. Billions of taxpayer dollars all over the world. You have no idea how many enemies we have um, in, in the world because we've been sending uh, condoms and birth control pills to people who would really like to have drugs for malaria or antibiotics. Um, but um, what they find is that women will use them and then they stop using them. They, they send people out into the village to try to get people to accept the use of contraception. And they have a certain rate of acceptors, and then they stop using them. Well, so why do they stop using them? They don't like the side effects, they want more kids, whatever reason, they stop using them. So, but then that's not good enough. That's not good enough, we have to go back and try to have other inducements for them to use the contraception. How did it get to be anybody's business whether an African woman wants to have four children, wants to be on the pill, wants to use condoms, why, why does the UN think this is their business? Why does the United States government think this is their business? You know, it, it, it really, when you think about it from that perspective, it's um, appalling. And then the final thing is, um, you talked about people being immune to the evidence. And I think when you read this material, particularly the international material, there's this idea that if you just promoted enough contraception, you could get all these desirable outcomes, right? And so I think when you're, you're that immune to evidence, as these guys are, that's not science anymore, that's ideology. And so I have a name for that ideology, I call it condomism. And, and condomism is the idea that you could solve all the world's problems if you just had enough condoms. You know, you could end world hunger, you could end, stop global warming, you know, you could solve all these problems if you just had enough contraception. No evidence is required. Okay, let's go on with another question. Um, the arguments for sexual morality are based on the idea that sex has an unchosen impact on the deepest levels of our personality. It doesn't mean whatever we might want it to mean. Uh, we're not plastic. In other words. What is the best way to explain this briefly to someone who doesn't buy it? One more time. <laughs> uh, to paraphrase, um, 
sex is going to have impact on someone's life, even if they choose to create a hookup identity for themselves. You can choose to have sex be meaningless. One way or another, it's going to have a deep impact on who you are. How do we communicate that idea to students who are colleagues or whoever who are very much uh, open to the idea and can create your own sexual self? In other words, uh, the question, if I take it, is, is uh, as opposed to the Keynesian philosophy that sex is simply recreational and that the only harm can come if you don't wear the condom, either the STD or the unwanted pregnancy. And other than that, uh, that there's absolutely no, uh, what was the word, sex positive, that was in the earlier breakout session? Who, who used that term that they're using on campuses now? Sex positive means anything goes. So that's, is that basically what they're asking? In other words, how do we communicate that, that unbonded or non-marital sexuality can, can have a negative implication? It's going to have an impact on you, even if you think it's just going to be casual. OK. Um, we're wired to bond. And uh, you know Larry Young's work with the prairie voles, the little monogamous creatures, I covered this earlier, but just briefly, uh, oxytocin and vasopressin are powerful hormones that function physiologically in our bodies. And for instance, oxytocin is important, probably more important in females with emotional bonding, but it's important in female sexuality, in lactation, with bonding to, to, uh, to the young, and in sexual physiologic response as well. Vasopressin, more important in male physiologic, uh, physiological functioning. Well, Larry Youngs and others have, have basically shown through these little monogamous, monogamous voles that if you block those receptors, these animals become promiscuous and the females lose the bonding when they're young as well. And then, of course, there's the study on oxytocin and trust in humans. And, and so there's ample evidence now, and, and no one that's not either biased or ignorant will argue that, yes, we are wired to bond. And, and so um, the, I think the, there's a really exciting paper from Nestler's group with pictures last year that came out on Delta Phos B, which was a molecular switch from 10 years ago. Uh, really, it was found to be present only in drug addiction in, in the last decade. And more recently, it's been found in natural addiction. Use the word addiction. I didn't use it. Nora Volkow, the NIDA used that word. Eric Nessler at Mount Sinai is now using that word with natural or processed addictions like food, sex, obesity, pathological gambling. And so uh, bottom line is that we're wired to bond. And we are wired to bond to the object of our sexuality. And it will affect us. Uh, there is dendritic arborization after one sexual experience, which is neuroplastic change in the brain. And that was the pictures paper from last year. I think it was Journal of Neuroscience. So the evidence is there. And um, you know, we, uh, we need to treat sexuality with the respect that it, that it deserves. Okay, can I respond to that as if I'm in the dorm room? I mean, if, if one of our students was back with that, though, uh, if the, the clever person is going to say, well, you just told me a minute ago that I can't look to monkeys and what they do in support of homosexuality, and you're telling me about this and what was the animal? Uh, so, how, I mean, so, I mean, I, you're talking exactly what's right yes. about how we can know this, but I don't think, if I'm that student that's asking this question, I can't repeat that very well, unless my interlocutor is a neuros, you know, neuroscience major or something like that. Yeah. So, is there, in addition to that, something that, or, or is it, you know, how do we... Okay, I think, honestly, I don't know how to do this biologically without showing the science, and the science is there. My, Talk from today has, I don't know, 100 references or so in it, and including the young paper, all of the vasopressin and oxytocin work. It's powerful. It's there. It's real. You cannot argue it away. And it'll be on the website. I'll make it available to the 11th Fidelity website. So you can look it up. You can read it. You can use the papers. You can show it to me and say, explain this to me. Um, I, I have many neuroscientist friends that I work with around the world, Melbourne, Australia, too. And, and no one now um, will argue that understands neuroscience, that process or natural addictions are real brain addictions in the true sense of the word. Yeah, I'd just like to look at, uh, here, here's something you can try. <laughs> um, I, I have a book that's called Smart Sets, 
and the subtitle is Finding Lifelong Love in a Hookup World. There's a chapter in that book that is called Why Recreational Sex is Not Fun. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the observations in there is um, the prevalence of, of, um, of binge drinking associated with hooking up. So one question you could ask somebody, is, instead of answering, you know, turn the question around and ask a question back and say, well, if it's really so much fun, why are people getting themselves plastered in order to go through with it? What, what is that about? You know, why, why is it that people are, you know, doing all this drinking to go along with their sexual encounters if it's really some also fun? Some people fun. Was yeah, that but, like? yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> yes, the, the drinking can be an independent source of fun, no doubt about it, and sex can be an independent source of fun. The point is the correlation between the two, and, and I, I think you're not going to argue somebody into this, okay? I think that precisely because some of the people talking to you in the dorm are addicted. Okay, what do you know about addicts? They're not rational. They also lie, okay? When people are addicted to something, they're not truthful. That's part of the addictive process, right? So you're not going to argue them out of it, probably. The, your best bet is to appeal to some experience that they have had or can see in another person that they can see in themselves or see in others, where in fact something unpleasant has happened to them. For girls, you know, the experience of sitting by the phone or whatever, hoping that the guy will call, is, a, is an indicator that she has attached to this guy, even if she was drunk, even if she had it in her mind, you know, that she was not going to attach to him and so on. And, and so I, I think I think that as a general strategy is probably your best bet because you're not going to you're not going to argue them out of it. You know, those papers are probably not going to do it. I yeah, I agree with you. I just and I think was it Laura Session Step that wrote that hooking up book and she said there is no condom for the heart. Yeah. I remember that quote is powerful. So, but just quickly uh, following the, uh, the Jenny's point, uh, if you, uh, all of you I know people who do friends with benefits and oxytocin will make. A woman against their will uh, become attached often to the guy they're sleeping with. And uh, they wonder, why did that happen? This wasn't supposed to happen, but it does happen. Okay, uh, next question. Dr. George mentioned last night that the best way to alleviate poverty is through the institution of marriage. Can you expand on what he meant by that? Um, I think uh, for those who are my talk, um, this slides, I think, will demonstrate that there is a huge correlation. Um, you know, for one, I mean, you just think very simply, just sort of um, that it's just one less income when you are um, with a single parent rather than a dual income. Now, of course, there are families that um, where there's just one earner too. Um, you have two parents. Um, but marriage, um, as I, I as I was talking about earlier, um, there is a difference I think uh, between those who are married and those who are not. Um, we saw in one of the slides um, that. Uh, women who are educated tend to be married, and those who are um, not less educated um, are less likely to, to be in a situation, more likely to have a child out of wedlock, and that contributes um, to um, their situation as well. So there's these links, I think, um, that's pretty well documented in the data. Uh, marriage provides other benefits economically. Um, there's a really great um, literature looking at how married men actually earn more on average than single men of similar educational um, and um, and um, educational and as well as the work experience. Um, you know, sort of, you know, there's something about marriage that is good from an economic perspective. Married couples are um, on average build more wealth. Um, so it really uh, is linked um, from an economic perspective as well. So um, there is a, is a great link um, to that. Do you, do you know another thing that might work with some of your libertarian economist friends um, is to um, is is to look at it this way that that marriage is an institution for social cooperation. You know, you can if you if you really think about it. You know, a lot of your libertarian economist friends will you know have read Hayek and stuff. You know, and they think about the free market as an instrument of social cooperation, which is perfectly true. It is, of course, that's what the free market does. It, it coordinates a lot of activities in a low cost way and so on and so forth. So they'll be familiar with thinking about the market in those terms. And so what you can just point out to them is that parental cooperation, the cooperation between a mother and a father, is the most basic unit of social cooperation when you get right down to it. It doesn't get any more basic than mom, dad, and the baby, you know. Um, and, and so if that, if that unit is functioning well, 
Um, it's socially beneficial, and it's beneficial to the family, to the, to the individuals, you know, both publicly and privately beneficial. And if that unit doesn't work, that this is the, I think, the real powerful insight. If the parental cooperation breaks down, either because it never formed in the first place with your never married parents or whether it broke down through divorce, um, when mom and dad's cooperation breaks down for whatever reason, there really isn't a good substitute for it. See, your economist buddies will like to think like that, right? There's no good substitute for parental cooperation. Um, and and um, the typical thing that happens is that the state is brought in in some form or fashion to pick up the slack created by the breakdown of the family, hence the welfare programs and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, and all the psychological damage and all the fears that people have, and you know, there's just a tremendous amount of harm that can be done um, by either parental absence or parental conflict or whatever it is. So um, all of that enhances the power of the state. And the final bit of evidence, kind of the final nail in the coffin, if you're talking to your, you know, some of your libertarian friends, is to just point out the following that, that um, socialist governments now, worldwide, I'm thinking particularly of Spain, a lot of them are leaving the economy alone. You know, when the socialists came to power in Spain, they haven't been fooling around with the economy. But what they have been doing is attacking the family, really quite systematically. And, and when the Pope was in Spain not too long ago, you know, they just kind of ticked off all the things that have happened since the socialists came to power, including abortion, divorce, and same-sex unions. And why is that? It's because if your goal is to centralize society, if your goal is to, is to break down the boundaries between the public and the private and, and expand the power of the state, well, you've got to do something about the household, for crying out loud. You know, that public-private boundary has got to go, you know. And so all of these uh, ways in which the family has broken down have, in various ways, opened the door for government um, involvement in private life that is really not possible any other way. You know, so if you think about what the family courts take on for themselves when they simply adjudicate a single contested divorce, you know, and you think about what the, what the family court will end up with authority over um, in a contested divorce, you know, they're t telling people how much money to spend and, and, you know, who gets to see the child on Christmas and Thanksgiving and, you know, tremendous number of things that are really none of their business. Um, and the leftists love that. They love that stuff, say. And, and so I, I think that's another um, thing that you can use in your arsenal when you're talking with that type of a person. Okay. Question for Dr. Carroll. How do you tactfully invite people who seem uninterested in seeing past immediate pleasure to consider a view that values a long-term vision of happiness? Yeah, I had your name on it. <laughs> You're fundamentally into the area of motivations and perspectives. I think it's part of the reason, at least in the marriage domain, uh, the marital virtues work has been quite revolutionary. And we're right in the middle of a, a, quite a discussion right now about the current marital therapies and, and patterns because we've used behavioral approaches because they're easy to see and they're easy to treat and they don't tend to have the lasting effects that we hope they will. Because there is this changing of the heart. There's this changing of understanding and perspective. Part of it though I think does go back to do we believe that we're trying to change somebody or are we inviting them to understand their natural self? Uh, part of it we've talked all through the weekend about lies and myths and uh, the perspectives that are out there that are so much a part of, of the culture. So I think the starting point for this is when people disagree with our views or perspectives is to take a compassionate view and see them more as perhaps deceived or clouded in their vision, uh, but not necessarily question fundamentally what they desire and what they want. I mean, that compelling statistic that does show that still over 90% of Americans desire a successful, lifelong marriage. You can put that wording into the survey and you still get that. So in many ways, it's not the outcome 
that is, is problematic. It's the pathway and the journey to get there. Uh, but oftentimes, as, we, as we've talked about, the, the natural needs for attachment, the natural needs to belong, uh, the reality of the, the biology and physiology that goes with that, I think it is as much about inviting and sharing with them uh, those views uh, and, and, and that process of it. Uh, but anytime we get into the change of, of, of motivation and perspective, uh, that becomes a two-way street. It really is a process of invitation, but not something that we can control or that we can dictate. Uh, but we can uh, uh, share with them experience, we can share with them our views, we can share with them uh, empirical realities and invite them uh, to see that. But I think it also has to be deeply uh, coupled with, with compassion and humanity, understanding in many ways do we see ourselves trying to help uh, perhaps even rescue, if you will, uh, from a culture, uh, rather than perhaps uh, demonize or, or, or just see it as, as, as people who have fundamentally uh, different uh, makeups or fundamentally different approaches to things. Uh, it's often as much uh, an issue of confusion. One thing I would add to that too, back to our earlier discussions about uh, uh, the development of things and how would you describe that, that casual sex is, is, is going to be problematic whether a person wants to personally define it or not. I was talking with some of the students the other night. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, the attachment literature right now is a powerful one. Uh, Bowlby's attachment theory uh, beginning in childhood and moving forward into the into the adult relationships. Uh, and the, the, the growing body of literature we have there that really does support and go in tandem with the biological processes of a true need to belong and to have that security and to have that attachment. And it is tied into the biological attachment systems and caregiving systems and that type of approach. That kind of language and that kind of dialogue also I think helps illuminate this idea of, of humanity. And it makes us remember that people navigating this process it's not just about the logical. It's not just about what's in their minds. Uh, oftentimes, there's patterns of insecurity. There's patterns of real struggle that are driving uh, uh, many of these patterns. Uh, people seeking for belonging in counterfeit ways. Uh, again, it's not their motivation. It's their approach that's creating the difficulties. They want the connection. They want the belonging. So I would start there, but also have the realistic perspective that it is about an invitation. An invitation would be about dialogue uh, in, in that regard. And I do agree with the idea that ultimately this won't be about uh, you know, shouting somebody down or proving them wrong. Uh, I think it has to be uh, our tone will matter as much as our content, I guess is what I'm trying to say. A live question. Uh, I was reading recently about this uh, 40th anniversary of the book Future Shock that was written by Alvin Toffler. And they're talking a lot about his predictions of the future. And one of the things he had talked about was this uh, society of rapid technological change. And he compared it to what had happened in the region with the agricultural revolution. Um, you had this extended family that stayed in one place. And then you had an industrial revolution where there was a nuclear family that replaced the extended family. And I think if he came in here tonight, he might say something like, well, guys, uh, you know, you're, you, you, this is an attack, you're portraying this as an attack on the family, but really the whole social order is being transformed by this new technology, this new economy, and these old social structures are kind of collapsing. So I'm just wondering, if that's a pretty hard question from my point of view, I'm wondering if you had any good answers to that. Yeah, I, I'm happy to answer, take a stab at that question because I think that um, the idea that just because technology is changing that we have to change or we can change or whatever, I think that what all of the panelists are dealing with is the fact that there's a deep human reality, <clears throat> there's a deep human reality that has to do with our need for attachment, our need for bonding. It's a need that we have in infancy, the need to attach to our mothers so that um, we can't just be passed from hand to hand, that, that, that doesn't do it, you know? Um, and, that our, and that passing our own selves from body to body um, doesn't give us the, the attachment and sense of belonging that we, that we crave. And so that, that um, in a sense, we've come to the end of the line of how much we can break this down without doing so much harm to our psyches um, that, um, 
that that is not sustainable, you know. And so, in in a sense, saying that adults get to be as free as they want to do whatever they want, um, that's not. We're, we're discovering, I think, that that is not a long run sustainable situation because the kids are in a situation where they're less free because they have all these insecurities and pathologies, and we have all the government expense associated associated with dealing with all of that. And, and some of that is hardwired into the nature of who we are. Um, that, you know, we've been talking a lot about science. Let me just say one theological thing, um, which is that Christianity has always taught that the human person is meant for love. And so I read Bowlby's stuff as saying that that's true, you know, that we can now prove that. I read the, the attachment stuff, the, the uh, oxytocin business as saying that's true. You know, the human person is meant for love and that, that a baby that doesn't encounter love is a wreck, you know, and a, and a human adult who, who um, tries to be sexual without, without love you know, is, is, is damaging themselves, is wounding themselves. So I think um, we now have the science to show uh, that it truly is not good for man to be alone. In, in a sense, you can say it's not even possible for man to be alone. I, I think that's what the science is telling us. So I, I, I don't know what, I don't, is Alvin Toffler even still alive? I don't, I don't know what he would say if he was here, but I, I would say there's some irreducible realities that we can't trick out technologically. Who wants the pressure of the last question? Oh, oh, uh, wants to say more. Oh, I'm sorry. I just say, you know, an interesting um, parallel to that or comparison is Gary Steinhardt's new book, Super Sad True Love Story, and it's set in the not so distant future. And you really do, see, I mean, it's also a commentary on the economics um, situation that we have. But also, the just one of the themes that's underlying it is the implications of advancing technology. And the way it plays off in the different characters and stuff is it's just a fascinating read. It's a bit of a raw book, so you're not gonna find it recommended from your Catholic or Christian outlets. But the 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 commentary I think is very, very effective, particularly as it plays out in human relationships. And uh, Steingart has some one or two great interviews, one I think with PBS on the news hour, and one with uh, National Public Radio, and he's an atheist, and yet he's saying things that I think um, a lot of social conservatives would agree with, precisely on this question and the, the idea of relationships, also the effects of pornography. It's just, it, it might be just a fun thing to add to the pile. If you're, it sounds like you've got a reading pile, so add that to it. Coming back. Hi, um, I'm Michael. We've talked a lot this weekend, I guess, about uh, the arguments for um, traditional marriage, etc., uh, especially as they relate to a lot of the gay marriage issues that are on the table today. Um, but I'm wondering, on a more kind of practical, personal level, uh, what advice can any of you give on how to deal with uh, relationships with persons on our campus who do struggle with same-sex attraction or do identify as gay? Um, whether that's in college life on our campuses or just in the larger culture, I guess. But even if kind of opening marriage to these people and to these unions is improper and maybe impossible, um, and even maybe if the actions themselves are intrinsically immoral, how do we address the people themselves? And yeah. That, that's a great question. I'm glad that's the last question, actually. Um, do you know, I was here when you all were doing the, um, when the Anscom Society was trying to get the, the Center for Chastity. I forget what you guys were calling it, but I remember that the, when I lectured, there was a kid in the audience in exactly that situation. And I remember, I don't remember your all's relationship with that kid, but I, but I remember thinking, I had not thought about this before, but I, I think it's very important that um, you all who have chastity clubs of one form or another, that you, that you welcome those guys, um, that you do what you can to be supportive of them living a chaste lifestyle, you know? Um, because they're not gonna get that support from anyone else, you know? If they self-identify as, as, as gay, if they say, I'm experiencing same-sex attraction. The first thing you know, people are going to be telling them, act on that. It's in your interest to act on it. It's in your interest to identify yourself even more deeply with that attraction that you, that you experience. But I think it's really important that you guys offer um, a humane alternative to that, which is to say, you know, look, 
you know, I, I, I don't know why you're gay, and I don't know if you can change what, how you feel, or, and I'm not here to change how you feel, but if you hang around with us, we'll be nice to you, give you something fun to do, um, you know, that's not sexual in nature, and, you know, this is a place for you to hang out and be friends with us, and, you know, yeah, we'll talk about stuff, and we'll probably argue and disagree and stuff, but we want you to be our friend, and we want you to be here, and, um, you know, we, we feel like we have, the, that the lifestyle we're choosing for ourselves, we, most of us hope it will end in marriage. We don't expect that that will necessarily happen for you, that you're, you know, that chastity isn't leading you to marriage, but chastity is leading you to something good, which is to a, a, a vision of yourself and a, and a lifestyle for yourself, which is worthy of you, and that we think will be wholesome for you in the end. So we want you to hang around with us, and, um, and uh, yeah, to whatever extent that you can do that, I, I honestly think, I mean, I think, I know that will be a huge challenge for you, because some people aren't always pleasant about it, but on the other hand, you guys are, are at a, a your peers are making big decisions about who they're going to be and, uh, and, and how they're going to behave and how they're going to interpret the feelings that they have, and, and you can help them. And uh, I, I, I mean, I think you can be a, for, a, a force for good. I, obviously, you can't control what they're going to do with all of that, you know, as we've already, as we've already said, but I, I think you can be a force for good for them. So I would encourage you to, um, you know, sort of feel your way along. So to speak, you know, there isn't an answer here, but I, I think I think there's an approach that that could be helpful. Okay, would you join me in thanking our? Next?